I'm sure you've heard this word karma. Um, and I, we all have like an idea in our minds about what it might mean. Uh, like retribution, you know, or like just desserts or even the reason to tip better uh, or something like that. Um, inevitably, as it made its way to us in the Western cultural sphere, it got mm, probably simplified as it made its way from the Indian tradition. And we kind of like molded it or like polished it a little bit to let it fit into our kind of cultural understanding. Um, and so perhaps because this is so, you know, commonly, uh, people are so commonly aware of it um, and maybe it's misunderstood. I'd like to kind of take apart what on what karma is and where it comes from and the role it plays in like the yoga spiritual tradition and the wider Indian tradition. And of course, as always, how it can help us live better now. So the, we have this English word now, karma, um, but it comes from a Sanskrit word, which is actually karman, with an N on the end. Uh, again, it's from the verbal root kr, which means to do, to act, to make. Um, so karma refers to the action that you do, but also, of course, and this makes sense, to it, karma refers to the result of this action, the consequence. Um, and it arose kind of like as an under, a way of understanding where, how we get to what we have now, understanding how the world works. So it's, it's basically a form of like cause and effect, which is crucial throughout the yoga tradition. You, cause and effect is so important that what we have now is the result of what occurred previously, not just materially, but ethically, the state that we are in now is because of the quality of our actions and the actions of others and general actions previously. So it means that it gives us an ethical framework then and an ethical like motivation to perform good actions, to, to be ethical and to focus our actions and not just do like whatever, <laughs> because we know that our action is not going to be without a consequence. Right. And uh, it basically means that in a kind of Newtonian way, karma is halfway between physics and ethics because it describes how like what happens in the world. But it also just kind of has a, a moral value judgment attached to that. Um, from the start, karma, as it kind of became popular in the Indian tradition, went hand in hand with ideas of rebirth. Um, or, uh, you know, now we know it as transmigration. Uh, but uh, basically the idea is that when you die, you don't just dissipate, but you come back again and you'll be reborn. And there's this process where you've got the karma that you've kind of um, accumulated throughout your life, like the baggage of all the stuff that you've done, good or bad. And when you die, this store of karma determines your next life. And it's not only what kind of birth you're going to have, whether it's uh, what kind of human, what kind or, or an animal or even a plant, uh, but also the lifespan, how long you're going to live and the experience of your life. So how much pain and how much pleasure you will experience uh, during this uh, next lifetime. Um, and I won't say too much about, uh, you know, the rebirth. Kind of we can come back to that maybe, but I'm focusing right now on karma in particular. Um, and the reason why is I find it so fascinating and so concrete because it's about action. And it basically has the idea that uh, what happens in the world and what happens for you in your life and your next life spiritually is determined by action, what you do, right? Um, and so it's not divine intervention. It's not God who decides whether you go here or here or here. It's you and your actions that decide it. And the same also, it's not deterministic. It's not, you know, you're not caught in a fatalistic loop. Karma, on the contrary, emphasizes your choice to make the right decision about what you're going to do. It emphasizes the fact that you have free will and you have the possibility of acting well, you know, dharmically, according to dharma, according to like the, the, the rule of the greater good, or you can make the choice um, to, to act kind of adharmically, um, you know, to act badly. Um, and 
in the yoga tradition, action is kind of understood as what makes you a human, in a way. Um, you know, you can't not act if you're human. So in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3, it says, Indeed, no one can exist, even for a moment, without performing action. Everyone is forced to do work, even against their will, by the gunas born of Prakriti. So if you're not sure about what gunas are, I just talked about them in my previous video, basically like the material forces of nature. Um, and it basically means that if you're in the material world, you can't just like not, you can't act, can't not act. Just by breathing, you're changing some the chemical makeup of the room that you're in. Um, in order to eat, you have to get food. How are you going to get food? Well, in the modern world, you have to have a job, most likely. Or, you know, in the, in the you know, agricultural societies, you had to grow your own vegetables. And in order to grow the vegetables, you had to do this and blah, blah, blah. So there's a chain of actions that you need even just to survive as a human being. Um, and in the Gita, it also says when things are inevitable, you shouldn't mourn them. You should try and do them skillfully. Um, and so that's what karma asks, asks us to do, is to know that action is going to come forth from us because we are you know, beings in the material world with agency and free will. And so it's our duty as, as you know, good spiritual humans to make sure that the effect that we bring into the world is going to bring something good as opposed to something bad. So that all probably sounds quite familiar. Um, but even more than that, the thing is that the karma, the understanding of karma isn't like some sort of spiritual boomerang where the thing that you do is going to come around and bite you in the ass, sort of. Um, but more than that, it's a very sophisticated understanding of the psychological cause and effect. And I'll tell you why. There's this uh, phenomenon called karma bandana which is the word karma that we're talking about, and also bandana. So it comes from, if you know the word banda, uh, which is cognate with the English word bind. Um, you know, in, in physical asana practice, we have binds, and you have bandas that you use in your practice, energetic locks. So karma bandana is the binding influence of action. The more you act, the more entangled you're going to get in the material world. You act, and when you act, you feel something as a result. Um, and as, as a result of the feeling, it determines your, your actions thereafter. It goes like this, action, impression, desire. Desire for action, which leads to an impression, which creates desire. So everything that you do is necessarily gonna make you feel a certain way. And I really love this idea because it basically means that you, at least your material nature, is made up of your actions. Which means that you can see where, where on earth it came from. Like you can kind of see your past history. But more than that, if you're made up of your actions, it means that if you can change the way you're acting now with your free will that you've got, then it means that you can change who you're going to be in the future. Now, the thing is that this kind of being caught in the cycle of karma. Um, on the one hand, it means that the more you act in your life, the more you're going to be, and we inevitably are going to act, so you're going to be reborn. Because you act so much in your life that you create a store of karma, whether it's good or bad, there can be both good and bad karma. Um, and at the end of your life, it, you're determined about where you're going to go next. Um, and that's like the kind of ma macro scale of karma. I like to think also of micro karma, where every action that you do leads to who you are next. So within, even if you don't believe in rebirth, this is why I'm not talking about rebirth as necessarily as going hand in hand for karma, at least in the modern context, and at least for me. I like to think that uh, karma can be a teaching which helps you to have control over your life going forward. Um, but for the yogis, you know, traditionally, the teaching of karma was one of how to get past from suffering. Because this idea that you're going to be reborn again and again and again and again and again, they called it samsara. This was basically synonymous with suffering. You know, that all of life is suffering because either you get what you want, 
but then it runs out and you just want more and you have to keep striving for it or you don't get what you want and it's suffering either way. Um, and so basically they wanted to get away from all of this and they had different techniques of how to do it. So the first way to get past karma is to basically not act at all. Um, so for example, the Jains really liked this. What they uh, often did was literally like even now Jains wear a mask across their face to prevent themselves from inhaling insects. So you don't, uh, to prevent themselves from killing, from creating that karma. Or they sweep the ground in front of them so they don't trod on anyone. I really like this statue right here of Gomateshvara, who was a king who went to the forest to meditate and stand still for so long that the trees actually grew around him. You know, so um, the trees growing around him actually demonstrate the fact that you can't really not act because even by standing still, you're becoming like uh, a support for the trees to grow. Um, so uh, the Bhagavad Gita actually s emphasizes the point that it's, it's not possible to um, fully not act. I already read you the quote where it says no one can, can live without making action. Um, and at the beginning, Arjuna, you know, he'd heard about all the, you know, the shramanas and, and the people who were renouncing worldly life. And he was like, I'm just going to, I mean, I'm not going to fight in the battle. I'm just going to go and live in the forest. And I'm going to just like be pure like that. And that's fine. And Krishna's like, no, dude, that's not even possible. Um, you are a, a, a kshatriya. You are a warrior. You are, your role is to be here in the world. So you have to act. But you can get past the binding influence of action by acting skillfully. And what's that? Um, so acting in a yogic way. The first thing that you could do is, uh, so in the commentary to the Yoga Sutra, um, Vyasa, who's like the main commentator on the Yoga Sutra, lists an good karmas that you can do, which are going to bring around good uh, good. Uh, influences for you and they are um, performing austerities, chanting mantras, cultivating samadhi, so cultivating this med meditative state of oneness um, and worshipping Ishvara the Lord or other great sages. So um, if every action makes an impression uh, it's understood and in the sutras it points this out that the the impression that we get from meditation makes a big impact on us and you'll know this if you if you do yoga practice meditation practice you'll know that the feeling that you get from it makes you want to do more um, the imprint of of good actions helps you to act better in the future so in a way it's also the binding influence of action but just in a positive direction um, and secondly, uh, there's this notion which is in, in the Bhagavad Gita, really kind of explored in depth, called uh, yajna, otherwise pronounced as yajna. Both of them are correct. So yajna, it means, um, you know, worship or sacrifice, or I like the word offering. And it means uh, making every action that you make an offering. So it can be to someone particular, it can be to, you know, um, uh, a deity of some kind that you're, that you're worshipping, or it can be to the greater good, or it can be to a person that you love. It can just be, it means that your actions become not selfish. But more than that, in this very kind of logical way, the Bhagavad Gita understands and explains to us that if we're thinking about the object of our actions, if we're lusting after the fruits of our actions, it um, creates further desire, further impressions. So, you know, if you do something and you're then, uh, and it doesn't work out the way you want it, you get disappointment. And the disappointment gives you like the feelings and desires to go and make it happen. So it kind of creates more and more karma. So if you do something, um, only thinking about the reward that you're going to get. If that reward doesn't materialize, of course, you'll be disappointed. But it also means that when you're doing this action, you are less focused, you're less present with what it is. You know, like if you are, um, 
you know, for me teaching yoga, if I, I teach yoga because I love it so much and I get pleasure and it doesn't honestly matter how many people are in my class. Well, it matters a little bit. Um, but so it doesn't really matter to me, at least spiritually, um, how many people are in my class, because if I can deliver a good class for them and honestly for myself, then I get, you know, the satisfaction from it. But if I'm thinking, mm, I don't know if they like to, I don't know how many people would come, God, I wish more people would come next time, you know, then it's just, oh, it's a horrible cycle that's very debilitating for me, first and foremost. So I make the decision to create, to consider every single thing that I do and offering doesn't always work, but I'm trying um, because then it means that it's a very pure action. So if you think about things that you do, like, you know, if you bake a cake for another friend uh, on their birthday or you bake a cake for yourself, you know, the one that you make for your friend is inevitably going to turn out better most often, because there's this love and devotion that's kind of baked into it, literally. Um, and the whole message of the Bhagavad Gita is that if you make every single action of yours an offering in this way, not only will you live better, uh, but also you'll be free from this, uh, this karmic cycle. Why? Because um, if you do the action for the, for the joy of the action itself, then you've already got your result, you know, you don't need any other external result. Any other external result is a bonus. Nice. Um, and so the thing is, again, uh, karma shows us on the one hand, it gives us a guide to this like chaos of reality, but we don't know what's going to happen. And karma says, okay, here's a simple notion. If you do good, good will happen more likely anyway. But also, it's more than that. We can know how things are going to turn out. So at least it gives you something to strive towards in a positive manner. And it also encourages us not to repeat the past, which sounds great to me anyway, is that by uh, acting yogically, by act, doing what they call karma yoga, which is making every action mindful, uh, devoted, sacred, you know, an offering, then you end up not living in the past, but living now. Living, uh, when you are less attached to the fruits of your action, the more you can enjoy what it is you're doing. And if you act without expectation, but do what you can, and as ethically as you can in each moment, then it allows you to actually live fully and enjoy just being alive. So I definitely think that this is something practical and very much more, uh, much deeper than perhaps is understood at first glance uh, in our, you know, modern context. So there's plenty more that you could say about this and basically read the entire Bhagavad Gita and it's very beautiful. Um, so for now, I'll leave it at that, but I'll see you next time. Om Shanti.